Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking time out of your afternoon to uh, join us here. I'm joined by Michael Price, who's our Head of Canterbury Dwelling Settlement, and Grant Laidlaw, who's one of our hub supervisors and leads a team of our assessors. And we're here today to talk to you uh, about the Canterbury Home Repair Bro Program, and in particular, and in particular, uh, how we go about assessing earthquake damage, the process for dealing with EQC when there's a disagreement over the earthquake damage, um, and just we want to give you a little bit of information about the process that we go through for assessing your home. Can I just have a show of hands here? Who are customers of the Canterbury Home Repair Program? I imagine most of you. And those of you who got issues with or unresolved issues with the Canterbury Home Repair Program? Okay, thanks very much. We're going to go, this is the agenda for today. Well, I'm going to give you so, a, a couple of brief words about the Earthquake Commission Act, um, assessing earthquake damage, resolving issues, and then, as Brian said, we've got half an hour for questions and answers. So I won't say too much about the Earthquake Commission Act, but there's a couple of things I just want to cover off with you just to give you some context. So we're effectively, we're a government agency, and our role is to ensure New Zealanders uh, in the event of natural disaster. Uh, specifically, we ensure uh, residential dwellings, not commercial or industrial. Uh, so it's dwellings, uh, residential contents, and a certain amount of residential land, all as a result of a natural disaster. Obviously, earthquakes being one of them, but also natural landslips, volcanic eruptions, hydrothermal activity, and tsunamis. This is the Earthquake Commission Act here. This is what um, guides the way we operate. And in, I suppose in many ways, it's your policy uh, in some ways. Uh, it's, it's good for insomnia. I have to say I wouldn't spend too much time reading it unless you have to. The other point I want to make about um, our act is, and it's particularly relevant to the Canterbury Home Repair Program, and that's uh, EQC's, how EQC chooses or elects to uh, settle claims with us. So we can do that by replacing or reinstating the property or paying for the cost of reinstatement. So that's relevant to the Canterbury Home Repair Program because we do that, um, we do all of those uh, for this event. At the start of the, uh, when the when the earthquakes occurred in 2011, uh, the government decided, along with EQC, to set up the Canterbury Home Repair Program. That's not normally how we would settle uh, earthquake damage. We normally cash settle, and, and it's true to say we do that for other earthquake events around Christchurch that have around around New Zealand that have happened since 2011. Uh, but for the Canterbury events, given the scale of them, the severity of them, it was decided to set up a home repair program. And so if you, had, if you were assessed to have earthquake damage in the range of fifteen dollars to $100,000 per claim, you were automatically opted into the Canterbury Home Repair Program. If you're assessed to have less than $15,000 worth of damage, we would cash settle you. And if you had more than $100,000 worth of damage, then you're what's over cap. I'm sure you're all familiar with that term. And you're handed over uh, to your insurers. As far as the contents and land go through the Canterbury event, we, our normal practice has been to cash settle those. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of context there. Now, just, now this is really the crux of what we want to talk about. So this is around how we go about assessing earthquake damage. And some of the questions that we ask ourselves uh, when we first go to a customer site. So some of the things we want to know is what is the damage? So what is the customer claiming under the EQC cover? So what are they what are they claiming under effectively under this legislation with us? What caused the damage? So was it caused by a natural disaster or is there some other damage that to the dwelling that might have been caused by something else? Then when we've established that how do we repair the how do we repair the damage? So what's an, a lawful, what's an appropriate and lawful repair strategy? And by lawful, I'm talking about what can we do under our Act? What can we do within the bounds of the Building Act and the Building Code? 
And then how much will it cost to repair that damage? And when we've established answers to those questions, we can determine whether the property, the damage for the earthquake, caused by the earthquake, is under cap, whether it goes into the CHIRP program, or whether it's over cap. And out of the and if you and as a result of those, we typically will be drafting up a scope of works which outlines the damage to your dwelling and what we will do to repair it. And I'm going to get Grant up in a second uh, just to talk through that. So, so really, those are the key questions up front before we start the repair that, that we need to answer, which determines your path through the, through the Earthquake Commission's processes and whether you end up with a cash settlement for the under cap, or for, sorry, for the under 15 uh, damages, whether you go into the CHIRP repair program or whether you are over capped to your, and you end up going to your insurers. So I'm going to invite Grant Laidlaw up now to talk a little bit more in detail around the scoping process and how we determine what repair strategies are. Grant? Thanks, Mark. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, look, I'm just going to start off with a bit of my background, which is I'm a qualified builder, been in the trade for 29 years now. Um, I've been involved with the Earthquake Commission since uh, the Gisborne event, and I came down to Christchurch in October 2010. So I have been here for all that time. I've been through some of the major events as well, um, and I have seen an awful lot of damage. So, um, so when we get started in regards to what is the damage and how do we go about assessing it, now, most people would have a EQC assessment that we did originally back in 2010, 2011. And since then, we have we then ring up with Fletcher's EQR as part of the CHIRP program, and we re come out and we rescope properties and reassess the damage and bring it all up to date, ready for the builder to supply an updated price and determination where, where you sit as far as the uh, whether you're still within the Canterbury Home Repair Program or you are over cap. So we produce a document, it's uh, the Canterbury Home Repair Program Scope of Works. That, that is the latest scope of works for your property. Now, at some points we also, um, obviously we need to determine what sort of damage we're, in, we're actually uh, involved with and while we're there on site, we'll determine whether we need to get engineers involved and have the appropriate engineering designs put in place. So EQR have produced guidance documents. I know EMB have produced guidance documents. Um, we have our guidance documents is called the Red Book. Um, it goes through a process of a decision tree which comes to the final determination on how to repair foundations. Uh, and it's what we use to set scopes of works and repairs to foundations. Because um, I would say the majority of uh, issues are probably around foundation repairs, um, perhaps external claddings. The internal um, things are fairly straightforward to resolve. Um, if, if people have a, the opportunity, to, if they've got concerns, I think the best time to bring it up is during the joint process, uh, joint scope process. So if you've got an EQR supervisor on site and you've got EQC on site there, it's probably the best time to start raising issues so we can sit down and have a bit of a talk about them. Uh, we, we would like to think that we can put across our, uh, our point of view and we may ask you to perhaps provide further evidence of why you believe um, things aren't the way they are or uh, why you believe things should be changed. Um, so we form a scope of works. We then have the builder or a Fletcher's QS price the scope of works and its determination then is, yeah, is it still with the Canterbury Home Repair Program or is it over cap? Um, there are times when we start work and we then do go over our budget and go into a process called Protocol 1. Uh, at that point we 
we'd, there's very rarely do we stop a job, we'll carry on until the job is finished, until it's um, completely repaired. But there is a process if you believe that um, we start a job, um, you should not fear that um, if it goes over the cap that we're going to just stop, walk away and hand it over to your private insurer. Our obligation is to carry on through to the end of the job and see it through all the way. Um, look, I think the, probably the best thing is you're probably going to have a lot of questions and I'm probably going to have to be put on the hot spot here, so uh, I'm going to sit back down and perhaps let uh, Mark carry on and then people can just ask me questions as they feel the need to. So you're right. Thanks very much, Grant. I just want to jump forward to, so Grant's talked to you about the scoping process. Let's assume that you've gone through the repair process. I guess you want to know what sort of backups are available, available to you when that repair process hasn't gone quite as well as you would expect. And the answer to that is, there's a couple of, um, there's a couple of um, I guess, provisions there that we uh, are bound by. The first one being uh, the three and 12 months defects liability periods that all works must comply with under the building code. And the reason I've written three months there and 12 months there is there's been a recent change uh, under the Building Amendments Act 2013. So some new consumer protection measures that came in on the 1st of January this year, which has extended the defects liability period from 12 months to three months. So before, so before uh, the beginning of this year, anyone who was doing any building for you would be uh, obligated to give you a three month defects liability period in which uh, any issues with that building, you could all repairs or whatever renovations, you could go back to the builder and um, raise those concerns with them and they are obligated to come and repair um, whatever defects you've identified. Ministry of Business, uh, Innovation and Employment extended that uh, three month defects liability to 12 months. So as of the beginning of this year, any works that are completed from 12th of January uh, now have a 12 month defects liability period. And there's a slight difference here between the three months and the 12 months insofar as the, the 12 months one, the onus now comes on the builder to prove effectively that the works um, uh, that the works are not the fault, so any defects are not their fault, or words to that effect. There's also the 10 years implied warranty, so regardless of whatever um, written contract terms you may or no, may not have in place, there's a 10 years implied warranty which covers almost all aspects of building works uh, that must comply with the building code. So that not only applies to us, it applies to anyone else who's doing uh, building works around New Zealand. And I would suggest if you want any more information about those, the MB uh, website has got a, a wealth of information around these, so I would encourage you to go and do a bit of reading up if you want some more details. The MB, um, so www.mbie.govt.nz, so you'll find all the collateral that explains those up on their website. So, just picking up on where Grant left off, so here are some common reasons why throughout the, particularly in the Canterbury Home Repair Program, customers or EQC may disagree with one another. And the most, most common reasons are there's a disagreement about the scope of earthquake damage. So a customer may have a view that X amount of damage to their home is earthquake damage. We may form a different view. Uh, EQC's uh, proposed repair strategy, so we may believe that to undertake a lawful and appropriate repair, we're going to fix the dwelling this way. Customer or their engineer or builder may have a different view and want it to be done a, a different way. Uh, there may be a disagreement about EQC's cost to repair the earthquake damage, and that's particularly relevant where the customer is taking a partial or full cash settlement from us. So we may uh, price the work up, let's say we think there's $50,000 worth of uh, damage, customer may have a different view, and so we need to work together with the customer to close that gap. And then after the repair, the other uh, common reason that we may disagree with each other is there's an issue with the repair. So what do you do when you strike those circumstances? 
So as Grant said, I think the first instance, I would be raising those concerns with the, contract, the EQR contract supervisor and the EQC estimator. Secondly, the Earthquake Commission's got a community contact team led by Paula McPhail, who's over the back there. They've got a presence in the end of the no hub here. And um, they're a great bunch of people. They um, seem to have a way of working their way through the organisation, getting to the root cause of the problem, and they um, have resolved a lot of issues for a lot of customers, so I'd encourage you to make contact with them. There is, of course, the option of lodging a formal complaint with EQC, so I imagine most of you have rung 0800 damage sometime over the last four years. There's also a, a, an email address there which will send your complaint directly through to the complaints team. And the benefit of doing that is you get something in writing, it gets lodged as a formal complaint and managed by our complaints team. So they're really the three, the three main ways of dealing with a disagreement with the Commission. There are alternatives though outside the Earthquake Commission. There's the Residential Advisory Service, the Canterbury Insurance Advisory Service, Earthquake su Support Coordinators, so that's Nikki Goss and her team from the Ministry of Social Development. Uh, the Residential Advisory Service, of course, being backed by Sarah and CS by the Council. There's CTAS, which is the um, Temporary Accommodation Service. Again, that's Nikki's team at the Ministry of Social Development. There's CANCERN, which Brian's from, Age Concern. There's various other advocacy, advocacy groups out there. And of course, you might like to take some advice from a trusted builder, uh, an engineer, and possibly even uh, legal advice if regret regrettably it gets to that point. So that's pretty much the, the areas I wanted to cover off, just to give you a snapshot of how we go about scope and work, the process, what you can do when issues arise with the Commission and what your options are. <coughs> 